Don't we have self-control? We kind of don't at this point, right? So we have to submit to the fact that maybe if we don't have the self-control, we may have to go back to just these practices of creating boundaries. The boundaries are so, so important. They'll make your brain better, your sperm better, and just your overall sense of community connection. The big reason I want to have you back and to talk to you right now is I think that we're kind of inundated with so many things that we just come to accept as normal, yeah. right? So even as I'm putting my phone by my le junk, uh -huh. I'm thinking about what would Dr. G do? And usually, you know, with my phone, if I'm not like moving around, like going somewhere and carrying it, when I get anywhere, I take it out my pocket, get it away from right, me. Right. But why is that? Because this is something folks might have thought about, but now we have some more evidence on why you might not want to have your phone in your pocket. It's funny that you say that I was driving on the way here and I was like looking for the address and I had my maps going. And for like, I, f I just found myself just dropping on the phone by my legion, as you say. <laughs> and then I'm like, no, no, my sperm, my sperm, the liability. <laughs> I was like, I've read the research study. Um, man, phones are crazy because we can go into... The, what it's doing to the brain, but specifically in terms of fertility, mm. especially for men, it's wild for me that fertility docs don't bring this up. They might speak to the man and go, what's your diet like? They might. And then, but they'll, they'll, they'll most likely talk about alcohol. You know, you're drinking a lot and what is your diet like? But no one talks about cell phones, right? And as the when I read that study a few years ago at the Cleveland Clinic, right? Mm the renowned Cleveland Clinic talking about how the frequencies from your cell phone have an oxidative effect in the body. Just mm -hmm. like all the crappy stuff, like the crappy foods we tell people to take out of their diet right. because it works as an oxidant in the body and inflammatory, uh, it creates inflammation. So it does the same thing from the radio waves that are coming out of your phone. So I was like, whoa. And then I proceeded to read that these men are keeping their phone by their pocket not putting it on airplane mode or just continuously just holding it, right? Well, if I'm not on it, I'm gonna put it in my pocket. It's reducing sperm motility, meaning these sperm aren't even swimming to their best ability. And then viability, meaning that when they tested, half the sperm or more are just gone. And that's wild to me because if people are trying, couples are trying to have a child, the men's semen is almost directly connected to this phone. And if they're keeping the phone in their pocket, something that we need to talk a lot about more um, because everyone has a phone, yeah. everyone is on it, uh, most of us overuse it, and then most of us are putting it straight in our pocket. Now for females, I don't think there's enough research yet to know yeah. exactly how it's yeah. affecting, but I would expect at some point we'd see a similar effect to, to ovaries, ovarian health, uterine lining, something is going on too. Yeah, it's... I think it really boils down to something very simple, which is we are tinkering with things that we don't know the long-term effects of. These are all new things. Not to say that they can't be things that are advantageous for us as a species, but we're talking about different, you know, waves, for example, and your body has a certain resonance or different frequencies that our whole system is operating on. Like we are waves and particles and all mm -hmm. this stuff. And so we don't know the full ramification of the, how these things are affecting us, but you also mentioned the brain mm -hmm. as well. So what could be going on there? Yeah, and I love, Sean, that you said that we are energy. We are waves of energy. So we would think, it stands to believe that the, the main disruption would be an energetic wave disruption. So it just, we need to look more into how these are affecting us. Now, I haven't dove as deep as I'd like to on EMFs, partly because I'm scared because I do most of my work <laughs> from my phone. But um there's there's a lot of conversations that need to be had and it's and it's just at this point we should talk about it more um and more science is coming out that were like mm, 12 years ago 15 years ago we thought it was a lot safer and a lot of these regulations are based back then 15 20 years ago and we're using, right. using these regulations the phones are way more powerful with way more capability with stronger frequencies and we're like okay so Pew Research Center, this is in Washington, D.C. They research how the cell phones, how addictive we are, first and foremost. 50%, a little bit under 50% of us report being addicted to our cell phones, right? And they found 85% of us are reaching for our phone when talking to our friends and family, which is already disrupting the social fabric of really how we connect and interact. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because that's essential for our health, right? Connecting to community, connecting to family, connecting to people. 
the other side of it is that, especially in children, we're seeing brain changes, right? Cognitive changes, prefrontal cortex, right? This executive function, learn behavior, memory, mood, right? All of these things that are so essential in a child's development, we're seeing the children using the cell phone right around five hours or more. They're having brain changes. Not only literally their brain is changing, but also the chemicals of their brain, right? It's changing the brain chemistry. So the cell phone is having a direct impact. Also, we see anxiety, depression connected to it, which is wild, right? This is um, a recent study, and I, and I did a show talking about uh, anxiety and cell phones. University of Illinois, Champaign, they did a study on 300 students and they found, they concluded, essentially the, the, the students who have addictive behaviors, reporting to have addictive behaviors and connected to their cell phone, have higher, way higher amounts of anxiety and depression. Mm. Then the follow-up study they did, they showed that these students, especially when faced with an anxious situation or anxiety provoking situation, were reaching for their cell phones as self-soothing too, right? So it's interesting, the thing that's, that is really pushing the anxiety in the yeah. brain over time is also your self-soother. That I was, that, that's an interesting cycle to look at. Um, and then the last one with the brain, with children, this is wild, teens, teens using their cell phone more than five hours a day versus one hours a day with the teens who weren't, have an increased risk of suicidality, 71%, 71%. That's crazy to me. So not only is it changing the brain, changing the brain chemistry, but also there's an influence of you know self-esteem on there too. So the, the construct is, is massive, right? Now we're not only talking now about sperm and fertility, we're talking about how it's affecting our brain, how it's affecting our mood, how it's affecting our sense of community and connection. This is health. And unfortunately, overuse of the cell phone is really leading to detrimental effects. But this is something that I think it's one of the most pressing issues of our time because we are in a sense devolving from community and connection as we're living our lives through the phone. Appropriately, I actually just watched The Matrix last night. It's a documentary now, you know, but mm -hmm. I just watched it yesterday. And just seeing some of these similarities and kind of, you know, when he's popping up out of the pod, you know, and he's looking around at the other humans who are in effect jacked into the matrix. And it's, in a sense, it's kind of like if your cell phone dies, Right, and then you look around and you see all the other people who are in yeah. the matrix, they're jacked into the matrix. And we, again, we don't understand completely what it's doing to us as a species, but just look at the results we already have. It doesn't look good. So that aspect of it, and also something I talked about in my first book in uh, Sleep Smarter, I shared a little bit of some, some court documentation because it's really difficult as well when we have this new technology to prove that there's an offense taking place, especially these very powerful entities. And so the, the researchers were citing all this data showing an increase in midbrain tumors mm. in children because we grew up in a time when cell phones weren't a thing. You know, maybe the, it's like you get the Scarface like car phone, you yeah. know, <laughs> but you didn't have just a cell phone on you. And whereas we have kids today who are literally growing up with it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just more opportunity for this technology that we don't understand to be affecting our brain. So thank you for that, man. And also with the motility of the sperm, like really get that guys, <laughs> really get it. We don't, we want the good motility, we want the Michael Phelps swimmers. Right, you know? right, right. And so. now we just have sluggish snail sperm because of it, you know, <laughs> we want the Michael Phelps guys. With the Phelps. So man, it's so interesting that, again, these things that we just kind of accept as normal and looking at the bigger picture. So what do you suggest folks to do? So, okay, so number one, if we can, let's not have the cell phone in our pocket. Mm -hmm. What about the, 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 the social connection aspect? What can we do with our cell phones that, again, you mentioned like the majority of folks are picking up when they're supposed to be connecting with their friends and family. Yeah, what I found, it's a few things, because I found it's affected me and some of my relationships, right? Because for people like us, we're always wanting to reach the world. We're always wanting to teach the world, right? For better or for worse, it's ingrained in our DNA. And um, because of that, I'm always like, if I find something out that's really interesting to me, I wanna put it out to the world quickly. I'm like, here, look what I found, check this out. This is really interesting. Here's how you do better by your health, boom. Um, but it's affected my familial connections, right? Lovers. So what I found is creating boundaries. So I know that if the weekend's coming and I'm spending time with my girlfriend, I'm gonna go listen. 
I got a, I got, I'm gonna, I already planned a post. I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer some people. 11 to 12 or 12:30, I'm unavailable. She's like, good. I'll go work out. And then I have batch that time, so then I feel I can be completely present with everything I need to do on my phone. And then once that's off airplane mode, I can be completely present with her. Mm -hmm. So that that is the relationship part that's super super important. Um, and then just the practice of keeping it on airplane mode and away from you is really powerful. So say for example, I go to the beach with my friends which I did the other the other day. I left my phone in the car on purpose because even when no one was talking, I just wanted to be present. If not with them, then the damn ocean. Mm -hmm. Like maybe the seagulls, maybe I could just be calm and let my nervous system just relax a little bit instead of just reaching for my phone. So making these interventions on your practices, really utilizing airplane mode. And then at night, come, come nine o'clock, my phone is off. Like I say goodbye to everyone, I do my last phone call and I put on airplane mode and it's out of my room. I have an old school alarm clock to wake me up now because mm. still, if the phone is in my room, there's the there's the risk of me reaching for it and just answering something. Yeah. Those practices, I know how they, ridiculous they may sound because it's like, oh, we're, don't we have self control? We kind of don't at this point, right? So we have to submit to the fact that maybe if we don't have the self control, we may have to go back to just these practices of creating boundaries and really following them. For me, what works best if the phone's not in the room, it's in my car, I leave it, then I don't think about it. Right. But if it's in my pocket and there's some downtime and I'm waiting in line, for example. Right. Or like put, waiting for someone to come in front uh, to come into the car and parked in front. You always reach for it. But what about those times when like there's these subtle connections that we miss? Right. Like, say, for example, like, you know, when your phone dies and you look around, everyone's on their phone. How about years ago before phones when we could have sparked a conversation with a stranger that would have been so synchronous and so powerful and so like just make us feel better about our day and them feel better about their day. That's lost now. So. Yeah. If we can lean more into that and just create boundaries, right? The boundaries are so, so important. They'll make your brain better, your mm -hmm. sperm better, and just your overall sense of community and connection better. Powerful. I love that so much. So socially distanced from your phone, basically. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's another thing we should be really socially distanced from. The thing. So uh, I love that because, you know, just a couple of nuggets there. When we, uh, using it for an alarm clock, let's... Maybe, you know, for somebody, especially paying attention to your personality type, maybe you get a, like you mentioned, an old school alarm clock. Mm -hmm. And so you can outsource that to something else. And also maybe even if it is your alarm clock and you're not touching it, but maybe you grab it first thing in the morning, you just dive right into the matrix, mm -hmm. you know, or for me, it's work. So when I'm working, I got to get the phone away. Like I put it on a bookshelf oh. across the room. Like I got to. I put it somewhere where I can't just reach for it and do the just checks, right? So that's what we usually do is just, just check real quick, just check. And the same thing with social media, which can be an absolute time suck, I mean, to say the least. And then there's so much value to behold there, but rarely does somebody spend an hour on social media and then afterwards they're like, you know what, I feel amazing. I feel better than I did before. No, <laughs> none of that ever. And because it's so abnormal, and there's so much pressure and anxiety that can manifest from it from trying to do all this stuff see all this stuff our brains are literally we did not evolve with that kind of exposure mm -hmm. that's why we feel the way we do so you know having some dedicated time where you're doing the thing and even i love you mentioned that going to the beach because that's another time people might just bring out their phone i'm at right. the beach looking right. i'm on a boat the know? girls right next to me that yeah. same exact thing i was i was like man they can't even just be together or be with the beach the water and man it was like a photo shoot right next to me <laughs> yeah i was like damn this is the this is the world and even if but here's a little tip though it's not that you can't capture you know throw some throw some vibes up uh -huh. there but you know you don't have to post it. You know you yeah. can just record it, record a couple little things, and just put the phone away. Exactly. Rather than like getting into the matrix and like start looking for responses and all that stuff. So, super valuable stuff, man. You know something else that you've been talking about recently that I'm so grateful for is alcohol. Mm. You know, and let's start off with something that you know a lot of folks have experienced the 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 imminent hangover or they've experienced the poor sleep quality which is a big part of the hangover and there is a little bit of a biochemical hack mm. for folks that you mentioned recently that i thought was fascinating it's something new that i hadn't thought about and as soon as i saw i was like obviously yeah, why don't right? i think about that sooner can you talk right. about that man i'm just reading so much about green tea and matcha i've been such a fan of it for many years it started when I was reading about how it's effective for breast cancer, right? It's a protectant for breast cancer because that was the realm that I worked in for so long. And then I learned that alcohol is connected to seven other different types of cancer. 
a lot of that mouth, oral, the oral cavity, esophagus, uh, esophagus, for pharyngeal, uh, laryngeal, mm. breast, rectum, colon. It's crazy. Um, and then I was like, well, why don't we just drink more green tea? So then I was looking. It is protective, especially in the oral cavity. Um, and that's an important hack for me. Now, this is what I tell people. It's like these hacks don't negate alcohol drinking. I put up a little post yesterday saying that, you know, do, doing all these things like eating right and working out and doing all these really hacks like liver protectant is like a squirting a gun into a burning house. It doesn't work that way. Right. Alcohol will set the house on fire, but it's a way of protecting ourselves. And why not? Right. So I always recommend that people drink green tea or matcha before or after drinking. It's something that when I was drinking, I was doing. And um, I can't say it helped with the hangover, but I know that long term, hopefully I was helping myself from the negative effects of alcohol. And um, it's easy, right? So let's say even if you come back from drinking, you're back home at one o'clock in the morning and you're feeling a little buzzed up or really buzzed up, then I would suggest doing a cup of maybe decaf green tea, right, to be acting as that antioxidant towards those oxidative effects of ethanol mm. throughout the whole system, not just the oral cavity. Um, that's my little hack. And it's funny because when I put that out, people really took to it. They were like, hey, look, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting posts and stories, people making tea. They're like, I'm going out with the girls, but they're making tea. I was like, okay. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're gonna drink, you might as well try to protect yourself as much as possible. I love that. And it, just on that one principle of the antioxidant effects there and the oxidation, I don't think we think about that enough in regards to alcohol and the oxidative capacity. Uh, one of the things that I, I mean, I've been really trying to impress upon culture is with al alcohol is so interesting. You know, it's it's a macronutrient, but we don't usually think about it in that context. You know, we just think about the fats, proteins, carbohydrates, but we got water and alcohol. And with alcohol, it's so unique because your body can't store it. Mm -hmm. So it has to use it immediately. It takes priority over everything. So it creates this phenomenon called fat sparing. So your body's like, nah, forget the burning fat, any metabolism stuff, we gotta use this stuff. And I think that it's part of our evolution because it's so potentially toxic and oxidative. Yeah. So that it just all comes together and makes sense. And so having that little bit of a buffer is such a cool thing. And with that tea though, do we want, do we just get any tea? You no. know, <laughs> any kind of tea bags? I mean, if I'm on this show, I know the question's coming up. I know that you care about the quality just as much as me. No, and that's the important part. Unfortunately, when I was drinking tea around, you know, my alcohol consumption years ago, I was just going straight to the supermarket. I was like, yeah, green tea. All right, I'll, I'll get this this company. The problem is, is that they're not all created equal, especially matchas, right? Because they're more concentrated. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to tea, there's the risk of pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, as you talk about in your book, how it affects your your fat storage, right? Mm -hmm. How it affects your health, but also just overall. That's something we need to watch out for, but heavy metal is the other thing, right? Mm -hmm. Tea, like rice, likes to suck up, especially arsenic, lead, cadmium from yeah. the ground. So I would suggest, and I talk about a lot, how to look for this, but I would suggest that people, if they are doing this, you might as well get yourself the highest quality if you're Exposing yourself to alcohol, you don't want your body to do more work. Yeah, we're getting the benefits of tea, but also you want to make sure that it's clean, it's pure. And um, yeah, I do. You, you can call a company, ask about, look for the organic label. You can call a company, ask to see their certificates of analysis or if they test for heavy metals, which they should. And then a company that is really does all these things is going to be very proud. They're going to go, we have the best in the industry. Prove me wrong. Check this out. Look at that lead, you know? Yep. If I had a company and I had the best tea, man, I would shout it on top and I'd be like, maybe people don't care about heavy metals, but I do. Let's talk about it, you know? Yeah, I love that. And what about the tea bags themselves? Oh, this one is nuts. It's a great question. A lot of, the, okay, so, I mean, uh, when it comes to tea bags, a lot of them are bleached first and foremost. The bleaching process, like tampons, uh, they create dioxins. Dioxins are nasty, nasty chemical, and they affect almost every organ in the body over, over time particularly. So the tea bags uh, also have something called epichlorohydrin, which is connected to different effects in the body, but really can affect our thyroid, which is scary, right? Because there's a lot of men and women suffering with thyroid disease. Um, so not all tea bags are created equal. You want to watch out for the ones that are really smooth and silky. 
those are the ones that have been bleached and have really high amounts of epichlorohydrin. And, and then I know a lot of people are listening. They're running to their cabinet right now and they're looking at their tea bags. Yeah, so smooth and silky. You want unbleached bags um, that are using like organic paper or something where you can call a company and go, hey, I'm concerned about your bags. Tell me about them. And they can tell you about them. Um, because, and microplastics. We didn't even think about that, right? Mm, we didn't talk about right. that. Microplastics too. A lot of them are just made of plastic, the netting or, or the thread that goes around it but you dip it in hot water, they're all released. Billions of microplastics are released, right? That's a massive hormone disruptor. Now imagine someone wants to do right by their health and making themselves their tea in the morning, right? In the afternoon, maybe one before bed, every single day for years, thinking they're doing right, but getting exposed to all this crap. So not all tea bags are created equal. Not all tea, not all matcha, not all green tea. There's a lot of uh, logistics, but really once you find a really good one, you can just rest easy that you're doing really good for your body. Man, I freaking love you. This is amazing. <laughs> this, These are the same things that I've thought about over the years and I don't talk about often, but then, you know, to have somebody like yourself who pays attention to these things as well and does so much of the research and just bringing stuff, making stuff that we, again, we take, accept this as normal. We just did a masterclass episode really looking at the FDA and the regulatory uh, powers that it has and so many things meet this grass uh, kind of loophole, mm -hmm. right? It's it's generally recognized as safe, mm -hmm. and it's not accounting for things like microplastics, for example. And there have been many different uh, organizations speaking up about these things, but we have to do this for ourselves. We have to be our own advocate. And with our tea, again, we're looking for something that is generating health, something that has been used for thousands of years, but now we have these different modalities of doing it. And but we can also also do it better. And the company that I happened upon, and they were actually reaching out to me for quite some time. I was like, "What is this? Well, I don't know about this these tea crystals." But they they do a triple screening for toxins, heavy metals, no plastics. They have a concentrate of their matcha, for example. Mold. They test for mold. Yeah. They do stuff so freaking well. And once I started utilizing these teas from Peak, like I, there's no turning back for me. Like mm. it is, is such a, it is such a superior tea and processing and safety that I don't think much of anything really compares to it. Mm. So you, you drink Peak. I do, well. I do. It's one of the two that I drink and I really enjoy it. Um, I've had a relationship with them over the past few years and they've always been open. They've always been, they've always corresponded very openly about what, how proud they are right and it's not a cheap product but then again the way i look at it is like this is more medicinal right you have to look at these things as medicinal if you're going to spend 40 50 100 bucks on a bunch of supplements this should be one of your supplements and it's interesting because my tea is in my supplement cabinet it's not with the rest mm, of the food right it's not even with the rest of the teas actually because that's that's telling my brain no this is actually a really powerful antioxidant mm -hmm. the whole body it's protecting my whole system so that's why i keep it in there because I can look at it and I'd be like, yeah, all right, got to take my medicinal today. And then later I'll drink, you know, like a nice little chamomile tea or something. But that's my medicinal. Yeah. I didn't tell you this, but when they reached out to me, they mentioned you. And one of the times they reached out hmm. and I was like, oh, my God, he he's given this the green light. Right. And, um, you know, just spoke volumes. And yeah, I mean, they're they're absolutely amazing. And actually you get 10 percent off. I created a new thing with them. I don't know if you got this because they also they did a, like a shipping thing, but the ten percent off is more valuable. It's exclusive. Peaktea.com forward slash model. That's p i q u e t e a dot com forward slash model. Ten percent off the incredible matcha. My favorite is the pu'er. Have you had the pu'er yet? Mm -hmm. Really good. Yeah, I've tried the whole the whole line. Yeah. Oh, I love the ginger tea too. The turmeric one is really nice too. I haven't had that the one. The turmeric is man. You make that's another anti-inflammatory that I keep in there. The turmeric one, I put a little uh, coconut milk, uh, mix it up, sweeten it a little bit, and I take it right before bed. That's that's a vibe. that's a really good one. You know, so the the curcumin, obviously anti-inflammatory, but also has some benefits with memory, sleep quality. So anti-cancer anti-cancer yeah. anti-angiogenesis yep. so freaking good go to peaktea.com forward slash model and man if there's anything that i've really kind of leaned in on for reaching out to you and finding out like what is the efficacy of this 
because I hadn't been, I haven't had my finger on the pulse of it for so many years, mm -hmm. which is air quality, mm -hmm. air purifier. And it was probably about 10 years ago because prior to moving to LA, I lived out in the woods a little bit. You know, I was living in Wildwood, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's pretty, I mean, it's just pretty pristine. You know, we got Bambies, you know, in our yard every day. Oof. We got the wild turkeys, which they're the, they're, if anything that you need to be worried about, it's the they're wild savages. turkeys. Yes. Yeah. They look like some kind of freaking dinosaurs. <laughs> and they, they run in a pack and they, yeah. they're not afraid to let you know okay. that it's their street. It's their block. But anyways, but coming out here, I'm just like, the, I couldn't believe the smoke. Like. You know, we know about LA from back in the day with the exhaust and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of that's been cleared up, but when there's the, these wildfires, I mean, I, 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 was, I, I wasn't prepared for anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was so foreign to me. And so I started looking into, okay, what is the optimal air purifier? Not just in that context, but just in general. Like when we come into the studio or whatever the case might be, and I was like, I know who knows. Mm -hmm. And I sent you a message to find out. Mm -hmm. So why, why should we be a little bit more aware, if not concerned about air quality indoors right now? Man, it's a great question. This is like my bread and butter. I love talking about indoor air quality because it's something that I never looked at, especially even in school, especially working in cancer, especially in a cancer hospital. It's something that's not really even addressed. But then when you start really looking at what is a major driver of chronic disease and cancer, has a lot to do with what we're exposed to at home, right? That's the environmental toxins. One of the major things is air quality, right? Particularly not just, we're under this false pretense that outside air is more polluted than indoor air. And maybe sometimes, especially if there's wildfires, but on average, right? And this is from the EPA on average, 10 to 100 times more polluted is the air indoors than outdoors, mm. which is wild. Cause then you're like, well, why? Well, there's different reasons why. One, because we don't always open our windows. But two, because we use cleaning products in there. Yeah. Bleach, Lysol, all those nasties, right? Um, there is uh, part, it's partly connected to cooking, especially with Teflon, all of those particles released in the air. Couches, rugs, beds, not to overwhelm anyone, but just to bring that attention that there's the concept of off-gassing. It's, it's actually a phenomenon that happens and that off-gassing, those chemicals get into the air. We breathe them in. Children, dogs, us, we're all exposed to these things. So for me, I don't care if you live in LA or not, it's essential that you have something purifying your air throughout the day. And um, I have three air purifiers in my home, you know? And one, because I suffered with mold a few years ago and I got really, really sick. Like my mental cognitive health was a mess. My brain was inflamed. I couldn't remember words, it was bad. And moving into this new place, I could tell there was some musty, moldy smell in one of the closets. So I put an air purifier in there and I put a um, dehumidifier. Never felt the issues again symptomatically. But that's why it's important. It's not just the off-gassing chemicals. It's not just pollution from wildfires coming in, particulate matter. It's also the mold aspect. The home is a living environment. We have to not think about it any other way, right? It's always, it's dynamic. There's mold growing it's going away there's there's off gassing there's pesticides being tracked in from your dog or your children and we have resiliency but something that's really going to help is something like an air purifier that's why it's important especially in the room that you're in the most so i would assume that's a bedroom or if you're working from home maybe an office keep those air purifiers in there they're not all created equal um there's different branches of them but the one that i recommended you is for bang for buck it's really one of the the best up out there yeah we actually we have two here at the studio i saw it and you know the one that and it's clearly like it, it's clearly superior is the air doctor mm -hmm. and it's a little bit more of a, an investment for it but it's not just an air purifier but also ionizer right faculty as well what, what can you talk a little bit about that right so it has two different components and the ionizer one is one but the uh, so ionizer essentially just breaks down those chemicals and re releases them to inert substances. Um, but the HEPA is the big bread and butter for that, right? That's catching all of them. That's why you have to change the filter, the HEPA filter. But it's catching all that particulate matter, right? Which is really, really, really important. Um, particularly if you're not 
good about cleaning your home and you're accumulating dust, that's where all those toxins sit, right? Not only the off-gassing chemicals, but also things like mold spores, they're in the toxins. So what I tell people is if you have a child who suffers with allergies or asthma or anything, skin issues, or you do, or or you or someone's sick and you can't, no one, no doctor can put their finger on it. They go, I, I uh, you know, we can't find it. You have to look at indoor air quality. You have to. There's no way around it because it's likely that there's something in the home that is exacerbating symptoms and causing inflammation in your child or you or your dog. Something. So that's why I always go for HEPA. HEPA is really, really important, and the air doctor has that capability, and the ionizing is a nice plus on it. Perfect, perfect. I wasn't planning on dropping the name, and I know you curved around it too, but I'm going to reach out to the company and see if I can get some kind of a hookup. And if I can, it'll be at the modelhealthshow.com forward slash air doctor. Mm -hmm. And we'll set something up if we can reach out and get connected with them. Um, but outside of that, even beyond that, so there, there are many other uh, air purifiers, filters, but you mentioned just simply opening a window because of the dramatic difference in indoor air quality mm -hmm. versus outdoor air quality. Open a window, get the air circulating. So 100%. let's talk about some simple things that people can do, like simply opening a window. What about turning a fan on? Can yeah, exactly. So there's um, some cheap mechanisms out there where you can put them on your window and it'll, it'll have the negative pressure bringing air out from the inside, which will be really helpful. Maybe you can have that running for 45 minutes to an hour in your home or something, right? But opening the windows is so important, right? Because the air is gonna be able to circulate, it's gonna be able to blow out. And a lot of us, man, I, I had this friend and she was telling me her parents never opened the windows. And like, I'm, like we're talking about for years, that's just always closed and there's no airflow. And there's op absolutely mold in the home or, you know, it's, it's for me, I don't understand even in the winter, like when I was back in Jersey and I was like learning about this, it was cold. Yeah. And I remember when I was, it was in college, my mom used to get mad because I used to open the windows and talking about how I'm messing up the heat. But I just let for like 40 minutes, I just let the air flow and then close them all up. But we, we can do that. That's a simple intervention. Another one is especially when you're cooking, open up the window or turn on your air purifier. I don't know if you used yours when you're cooking, but the beautiful thing about the air doctor is it'll, a red light will go on when it's exposed to toxins at a higher load than it, mm -hmm. it wants. So almost every time you cook, it'll sense it, right? Because the combustion particles are going in the air and it's sensing it going, whoa, whoa, okay, I got to clean up. I got to go on, on elevation mode. I got to go on four out of four. And um, so making sure that you're opening a window, putting on your air purifier. Also getting away from nonstick. Nonstick is a really nasty chemical called PFAS. Those are the forever chemicals in there. If you watch, do you ever see the movie Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo? I don't think so. You have, well, you have to watch it this weekend. You have yeah. to watch it. I'm telling right. you, it is fantastic. And it talks about Teflon and how DuPont had pushed PFAS into the nonstick, but it made a whole town in, I believe, West Virginia really sick and how they tried to cover it up and mm -hmm. how they tried to pay off people and how they elevated lawyer fees and just, you know, drew out the whole court, the whole court case. But... Those PFAS are nasty, and they're in nonstick pans. So if you have Teflon, I would highly, highly recommend throwing that away. And then, and then, simple things like utilizing non-toxic cleaners, right? If you're using bleach, stop, right? Because that can cause asthma in your children. Not exacerbate, literally create and cause asthma in your child. If your child has asthma, you have to throw the bleach away. And get a non-toxic cleaner. You can literally make them at home. You can use Castile soap, baking soda, right? Uh, there's borax. There's uh, lemon formulas, there's essential oils, there's so many things you can use. So you don't need to spend a million dollars to do this. You can just make simple interventions and the home air is going to be elevated by exponential amounts. And taking off your shoes. you got to do that. Mom was right, grandma was right, your aunt was right, whoever said that was right because there are studies that show you track in pesticides into the home. If you have a dog, and my roommate does, he knows he got to clean that Doberman's paws every time because she's walking around Venice, right? There's a lot of those nasty chemicals, um, but also just all the stuff out there. But there is a study that showed there's an increased risk of cancer by way of your dogs tracking in pesticides. It can increase your risk of cancer, right? And I didn't know this until I spoke to actually a veterinarian. And I was like, get out of here. And he's like, the article made so many people mad. But really... That just shows you one intervention. Take 
two minutes to wash your dog's feet, right? Little Castile soap, little, little, you know, like hand wipes or just kitchen towels. It'll go such a long way, but you absolutely can track in all of these lawn chemicals into the home. Also children, make sure they take off their shoes, you know, and literally like taking off your shoes. How much does that cost? All right. Just bringing awareness to that is really powerful. I could see where people be pissed off by the dog um, uh, information, but right. this is like a whole new meaning to like get your paws off me. You get know? your paws but off me. At the same time, I mean, you gotta keep it in context. Like, where is your where is your dog traveling? The same right. thing is just the dog's built in little shoesies, you mm -hmm. know. So the same thing with our shoes. Mm -hmm. If we can do, just kind of pay attention to things like this. But I want to bring this also back to something that we both say which is we want to just, and I love this about you too, like just start with something, do a few of these things. You don't have to do everything, but when we start stacking the odds against ourselves and we just create this such a toxic environment, can we lean back into the Teflon, for example? Like what, what should people look to keep an eye on for something that would be, be better for them mm -hmm. to cook with? Yeah, man, this is, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing because people are always cooking at home. Someone's cooking at home, um, unless, unless, you know, you're just eating out all the time, which I don't know many people do. There's an importance in bringing in high quality. So um, I did a review on my show of cookware. I need to update it. I've done it, did it two years ago, but stainless steel, um, rule of thumb is, is pretty good. You just want to get a really good quality one, not a cheap, cheap one. You want to get a high quality stainless steel. Um, there is a risk of leaching nickel, but um, still much better than, like I'm talking about much, much better than Teflon. Um, cast iron, which is can be really good, uh, but if you have any iron issues, iron accumulation issues, then it wouldn't be good for you. And then um, ceramic. Now I have ceramic one. The issue about ceramic is they it's hard to cook with it because the food sticks on it and it's hard to clean with it. But I also know they test for heavy metals and it's really low toxins. It's, it's, it's a good one. But those are the rule of thumb, like cast iron, ceramic, and stainless steel would be a really good shift to start moving if, you have, if you're listening to this and you know you have Teflon and nonstick, right? And you can make really nice eggs because they're not sticking, but also understand that your eggs are, are absorbing those PFAS and you know, it's affecting your health. Man, again, everybody just take one step at a time. I know it, it can be a lot. But you have the right to know these things. And we, we tend to accept things as normal just because we kind of grow up around it. But many of the things, we like a cast iron skillet, for example, it's been used a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. Like humans kind of figured that thing out. But over decades, you know, we're just getting more about convenience, more about, you know, we want everything to be a certain way. And we, what, what are we sacrificing with our health to get those things? So I want to ask you about one other uh, of these seemingly inert things, you know, we just kind of accept as normal, which especially today is like one of the hottest things on the streets, which is hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer. Okay. Can you talk about that? Because I, I brought it up at the beginning of this um, uh, pandemic that's on everybody's mind today is really kind of taken over our world. And I was concerned about the overuse because you know it's designed in such a way, especially with these alcohol bases, to basically, your hands have a microbiome. It's right. not just the microbiome right. of your gut. Your lungs have a microbiome. Your you know you have a microbiome of your of your skin, as mm. mentioned. What is that going to do to the natural balance that protects you? Mm. And so I was brought. I put a red flag up. You know when I saw hand sanitizer is like a hundred dollars on amazon because everybody was buying it up right. what's going on there with hand sanitizer uh, maybe something else we might not think about and need to consider yeah it, but that's that's a ma massive point though the the microbiome disruption right it's the alcohol and the chemicals in hand sanitizer that are really affecting that biome right and I remember like when I worked in the hospital, everyone would just put their hand under the automatic hand sanitizer and then just, and it was so, it was so easy for that to happen for me. But for me, I was like, I know I'm going to do rounds in this clinic. I'm going to wash my hands instead of just continuously just putting my hand. It's literally every room we would go to, it would be mm -hmm. hand sanitizer. And it was like, I'm like, yeah. what is going on? But I knew that it was going to affect my, my biome in my hand. But also, 
Uh, last year, there was the concern for benzene, a chemical that is found, a uh, carcinogenic chemical that is found in hand sanitizers. Not all hand sanitizers, and a lot of the popular ones don't have it, but there was a massive list of, of companies that had hand sanitizers that are adulterated with benzene. So I, I talked about the list a little bit. I named some of them. But really, it's if you should look. If people are using hand sanitizers regularly, Look online and type in hand sanitizer benzene, and you'll see it'll be a nice PDF list that came out last year. And just cross-reference if your hand sanitizer is on that list. And if it is, move away from it and just get a better quality one. But really, there's nothing like just washing your hands with soap. That's, I would highly recommend that. Hand sanitizer is convenient, but if you have the opportunity, just go to the bathroom and wash your hands with soap. It's going to be better for your hand biome. It's going to be better at not exposing you with potentially carcinogenic chemicals. Wow. And it works better. Three things, three reasons why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's crazy, a carcinogenic compound like that. And, and, and in that alcohol format, which is alcohol help, helps to drive things into your skin mm -hmm. even better. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's, it's nuts. That was a concern. Yeah. So if benzene's in there mixed with alcohol, that's a problem. Yeah. And that's why that I was trying to bring light into that is because everyone at the time, everyone was using it man you look around people would just had it not only in their backpacks anymore in their pockets right in their yeah. briefcases right in their car console i was like damn like hand sanitizer blew up i should put stock in hand sanitizer right. or something what happened so nuts man so nuts and it happened so quickly you know so well this gets to something that i really really want to talk to you about because you're somebody who's operating from this place even with the hand sanitizer paradigm that mm -hmm. we're existing in right now it's still driven by a, a mindset. It's still driven by a thought process, a perspective about reality that might not be conducive to our health. And for you and your work, and it's kind of the, the, the undercurrent for everything that you do is really helping folks to realize how powerful our minds are and how much that matters in our health and in our healing. So can you talk a little bit about why that's a place of emphasis for you and why we need to focus more on this right now. Yeah, I guess, I guess the where it began, where it began was when I was doing cancer, uh, when I was just in the world of cancer and I was looking at all of the elements that have to do with cancer and two major, major elements that weren't talked about in my residency, weren't talked about in school, weren't talked about in the research enough were the environmental toxins, which we just spoke about. And we spoke about even on your on the first time we were together, like if we were just hammering it down. But the mind body is the other part of it. And it is a massive, massive driver of disease, not just cancer. And throughout time, the emphasis just grew and grew and grew. And then I understood essentially that the mind body connection is the whole part of the glacier, right? That is underwater and the ones we don't see. We just see the physical manifestations, whether it's an acute disease, something that is like chronic, but not really, you know, really making you sick, sick, let's say like a skin condition or really chronic disease where you're really sick. It's a major, major root, if not the root. And it's, it is how your mind, body and how, is connected and how you present in your highest authenticity. And that's it, man. It's like, what I found is that almost everyone walking around is holding in this fear that is mm. a fear of judgment, a fear of not being their highest self, right? And a fear of just knowing what makes them express and expand the most, but scared to show that. And I, and whatever it is, maybe it's you just dancing all the time, or maybe it's just you wearing crazy clothes, but it's really in alignment with your expression of who you wanna be. We lost that sense of really trying to express that self. and. What I found as I started going deeper into the psychology of it is that it happens most of the time when we're young. It happens, we create this adaptation mechanism where at some point, you know, look, you, you, have, you have a young kid, but I even go back when he was a child child and how expressive children are, yeah. right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven years old. They're, they're laughing when they're happy, they're crying when they're sad, they're yelling when they're angry, right? And they're just so curious about the world and they see a plant for what it is. They have no preconceived notions, they have no other experiences, they plant. Oh, let me move, wow, rug. Oh, let me move, wow, ant. And they move through the world in this like beautiful, conscious, curious, expansive, 
observation. We lost that at some point because we adapted differently. At some point, we were told that maybe crying wasn't safe, right? Maybe yelling is not, we don't do that in this tribe, in this family, right? Or maybe a teacher said, you're going to get expelled if you keep doing this. But you're like, no, wait, I, but, I, but my body's telling me to do this. This is my authenticity. And children are brilliant, man, because they, they know how to adapt. And they adapt. And they go, it's, well, I need to be part of the tribe. That's evolutionary, right? That's an impulse that I know. And also, I need to eat. And children say, I'm not going to eat if I don't adapt, so I better adapt. So I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to wear these really weird clothes that, that like I love wearing. And then we just change. And then we make this adaptation and then it becomes part of our personality. And then 25 years later, we think we're this adaptation, but we never were that damn adaptation. It was true at the time, but it's a story that's been holding us and holding us and holding us and not allowing our true expression. For me, health, real, real, real health, deep, deep health, glacial health underwater is allowing yourself to move through life in that highest expression of yourself, the truest authenticity, saying and speaking your heart, speaking in love, right? Wearing what you want to wear, saying what you want to say, go work how you want to work. But that's the power in health because to me, whether or not you're suffering with a chronic disease, you are, let, you are letting go of all the shackles that have been holding you down. And many times, many times, that is the final domino for your health to start regaining. And if, you're, if someone is out there suffering with chronic diseases, right, and you check the home air even, everyone's done, you've done all the tests, you've gone to every functional naturopathic conventional doctor, it might be something much deeper. It might be that you're not expressing yourself. An expression of self and authenticity is the root for me and my everything that I've done, the root for your highest level of health. Mm, man, thank you for that, man. You know, so I just picked up something really profound there, which is we, 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 we have this tendency to be so expressive when we get here on this planet. And it's just, a, it's our natural instinct to be so. But then we're conditioned to bottle things, right. you know, and what does that do to our health? And so much of it is unconscious, but our unconscious is what really runs our life. You know, we're only conscious of a small bit of what's really happening behind the scenes, maybe like 1% or upwards of maybe 10%. And so that's where the work really is. If we're talking about getting from here to being the best version of ourselves is being expressive, is allowing ourselves to say and to do and to express ourselves authentically, you know, but then we get to the place of like, how do we get from here to there though? Mm -hmm. You know, so what are a couple of things that people can consider to really help us to tap into that authenticity, authenticity and to, to open ourselves up? to be more of ourselves. Very simply, ask if the way you're showing up in the world, in, in situations, at work, in love, in family, in fashion, in, in, your, in what you say, if it's rooted in love or fear. If it's a very simple way, and you'll notice that majority of your life is rooted in fear. Majority of the way you show up is rooted in fear because you're scared of X reason that you've experienced as a kid or that someone told you is not the way we do things. But if you understand that you can express yourself in love authentically, that's the liberating part. So watch, like I can go, man, I, I just, they're, like my soul is so creative and so expansive and it just really wants to express itself through freestyle rapping. And I'm like, God, but I'm not a good freestyle rapper. It's so embarrassing. I never want to do it in front of, who cares? It's you honoring your deepest self, right? The soul can go, wow, I, you know, I just really want to express myself and wear like really bedazzled clothing, but like men don't wear that. I can't wear that. But like that is you honoring your soul. But see how you start feeling when you do little things chips away at honoring yourself, honoring yourself, then you'll find it's not just fashion. It's not just speaking up. It's, it's, it's not just rapping. It's speaking up and talking to loved ones. And, you know, you might, you might have been conditioned to say, it's not safe to tell my dad I love him because my dad wouldn't take it well. But you're honoring your soul to speak love. So if you're able to speak love to a dad who you know ain't going to take it well and still won't take it well, it'll be like, what are, you, what are you talking about, son? We don't, we don't talk like that. You're still honoring your soul. You have to ask yourself, are you honoring? Because everyone listening knows deep down inside very deep what their soul wants to do how it wants to express itself and ironically it's all in love 
The soul is going to express itself uniquely in its own right for every single person, but the root of it is always going to be in love, which is the most beautiful thing. Because imagine, imagine what the world would be in two days if everyone snapped their fingers and goes, wait a minute, am I authentically being me? Am I rooted in love or fear? And am I honoring my soul? No, no, no. Okay, let me make those changes. Let's see how the world is. Let's see how my relationships are. Let's see how, are. Let's see how better I feel in my damn body. The world would change in two days. There'd be no more war. There'd be no more starvation. There'd no be no no illusion of separatism mm -hmm. because we'd honor. I'd honor Sean. You got the sporty vibe. I love it. But you know, you speak your mind, but you speak it in love. You know, and I and wow, I'm inspired by you. Wow, I feel I feel really good around you. It's your frequency. Wow, you're reminding me that I have that in me. Let me express myself accordingly too and change the world. And everyone has that capability, but everyone is taught to live in that fear through parents, through authoritative figures, through social conditioning, through media. We've been, we have this, uh, the odds stacked against us, but we also have the conscious awareness now that we can always make that change. And that, I'm telling you, man, when you're in that vibration of health, it's really hard to be sick. It's really hard to have your stomach issues that didn't go away for a long time. It's really have to hard to have skin issues that don't go away for a long time or whatever it may be, because you're authentically just, ah, uh, your body's like, Thank you. Your body's releasing all that crap that you've been holding in for so long, figuratively. And then that's the power of just making that change. To me, again, that's true health. Yeah. And speaking of honoring, you've honored us by hanging out with us today. It's always a pleasure, man. Um, can you let folks know where they can check out your amazing podcast and also where they can check you out on social media as well? Man, I'm just I'm just trying to keep up with you, Sean. Uh, it's Heal Thyself Podcast, and that's on all platforms. The Instagram is Dr. Gonzalez, um, and I have the bio and everything's there. The website, you know, we have the Swell Score, which we do supplements and home stuff. We do like even expanding the candles, air filters, but it's a one-stop shop for the healthiest, hand-picked, curated straight from doctors, nutritionists, and scientists, putting it all together. So it's very, very intentional what we have on there, but it's the best of the best, in my opinion. So um, that's what we're doing right now. Where's that at? That's a swell score, but it's in my link in bio on Instagram. You can just go on it and you'll click it and the whole like website is there. Perfect. That's called a swell score. As we've commercialized and as we've capitalized, there has been places along the way where we've chemicalized these things. And, and so as we use them, there are things we're using every day that, that are actually undercutting us and our health.